In order to lift your AFE model out of the ordinary and to make it truly realistic, you'll need to apply a colour wash, which is a simple technique consisting of a thin layer of paint over the whole model. The paint itself must also be very diluted, and for this we'll use oil paints. To demonstrate the colour wash technique, I've built a Tamiya T55 in 135th scale, and it's been painted with XF57 Buff, which is an excellent base colour for desert-based vehicles. The XF57 Buff has produced a nice, even, flat coat, but it does look rather bland at this stage. The colour wash will help us increase the depth of the shadows and make the whole thing look a lot more interesting. In the past I've experimented with acrylic washes, but never really had a lot of success with those. Now, like most modellers, I use oil paint washes thinned with white spirit, or in the US, mineral spirits. You can use pretty much any oil paint you like from colour washes, but recently I've been using Abtilung 502 from MIG Productions, which are very, very finely grained and applied beautifully. You'll need something to mix your colour wash in, and I prefer to use old bits of packaging, because they're free and you can just chuck it away once you're finished. Like any modelling technique, you only ever really need small amounts of the materials to produce the effect you're after. So I'm going to decant some white spirit into an old film tub for maximum control. And again, you only need a small amount. Almost regardless of the model I'm working on, I start with a dark colour wash, as this seems to establish a good base for the effects to follow. This time, I'm going to use wash brown from the Abtilung 504 range by MIG Productions. The first step in the process is to make a concentrated wash, which will allow us to make thinner versions for actual application on the model surface. For maximum control, I use old medical syringes. Dip it into the white spirit, draw a small amount up, and squirt it into your tub. That's just about enough. Take the brush, and start breaking the oil paint down to make a nice slurry. You can see that it's quite thick at this stage, but it's very important that every little last drop of oil paint is broken down. The mix I made here is a little bit too thick for our purposes, so I'm going to add a bit more white spirit. Again, mix it round really thoroughly with the big brush. And here we have a concentrate unusual that I would apply something as heavy as this directly to the model as the effect won't be very subtle. So I'll take another old container, the same type, and pour a small amount of the wash into here. Then syringe again into this new mix and mix it around. And we have a wash, sometimes called a filter, ready for application onto the model. For a little extra control you can apply a thin layer of plain white spirit to the model, or the area of the model, that you're going to work on first. There's actually a little bit of wash in this, but it doesn't matter. This helps the wash to flow, and will also help to reduce the build-up of so-called tide marks, which is where the wash stops flowing and leaves a distinct edge on the model, which is something we want to avoid. And here goes with the colour wash. The effect is quite apparent at first, we just apply it in small, controllable amounts and let the paint build up in the recesses of the detail. Not applying too much, otherwise it will flood the surface of the model, and not applying too little, which will just sit in one place and not flow nicely. I'm continuing to apply the wash over the whole of the front of the model, working reasonably fast because we don't want the material to dry and leave us with those tide marks. I've got a thin version of the wash here, and I'm alternating between the plain white spirit and the thin wash mix that I made earlier. Another mistake that modellers often make is to apply their weathering finishes in a very even, uniform finish over the whole model. Real vehicles don't weather in this way. They're very uneven and patchy, and we want to try and simulate that in 130th scale. Here I'm just applying an overall thin wash so that we establish a base tone for the model. As you can see, I'm working quite quickly because we don't want the white spirit to dry and leave a patchy finish. It's a bit smelly, so make sure you ventilate your room. White spirit has no surface tension like water does, so when you apply a drop, it spreads very quickly, and you'll find this helps you when applying a wash because it will spread underneath parts and around detailed areas.
As you can now see, the model is glistening with white spirit wash, too much in fact, and part of the process is to mop some of this off in certain key areas. I'm going to use a piece of clean tissue paper to mop off some of this excess, not over the whole model, just on the tops of these stowage bins and fuel tanks and any areas that seem to have too much of the wash on. You don't need to press too hard, you'll break the model parts off if you do anyway, but just mop some of the areas off again to add to a nice uneven finish over the model which will increase the realism of the effect. Now that that base wash is on and pretty much dry we can go back with the same colour and same mix, the second mix, and re-accentuate some key areas like the top of the gun barrels mount here where dirt might accumulate and little areas of detail that might need extra work around these bolts, along the weld seams and again small dabs, small amounts of paint at a time and allow the colour just to flow across the surface. If you put too much on in one go like that we can take a tissue, gently dab it off and we're back to where we were. It's a very controllable technique and you can go on for as long as you like to build up the technique. It's important to remember that when applying a colour wash you don't have to do it all in one go. In fact it's important really not to because the paint needs to dry and the more you put on you'll just be disturbing the layers below. So I'll often do the basic colour wash then leave it overnight to dry and come back to it with some fresh eyes. Maybe change the colour slightly, maybe add a little black or some green just to break the tone up a bit and then add another layer so that we get a nice three dimensional look. It's important to keep the effect random and uneven in the way that nature would randomly and unevenly attack the paint finish on the real vehicle. So it's just a case of using your imagination, looking at references, looking at books, looking at the real world, seeing how things become dirty and stained and applying it to your model and having fun. And trying to simulate the effects of rain, even in the desert you'll get moisture running down the vehicle at night and rain will follow the shortest path possible so try and imagine where the rain might run and make streaks on the vertical or near vertical surfaces to simulate where moisture may have run down. As the wash dries the effect lessens so it's important to stop, step back a little bit and see how your effects are building up because it's easy to get carried away and then it ends up looking rather stripy and horrible. But colour washes are very flexible techniques and you can make corrections and even localised areas of respraying if you're really not happy with what you've done. So it's very, very rare that we can't rescue a model from one of these techniques if we make a mistake. To better show the extreme weathering effects on this model, I'm going to apply a contrasting dark green camouflage, which is pretty much what I did when I built the uh, Tamiya T55 a few years ago. I'm going to use Tamiya XF65 Field Grey, which is a great all-round dark green colour. As you can see, I've used some white paper to blank off the tracks. This doesn't have to be particularly sophisticated, it just stops the overspray from the green getting onto the tracks, which will look pretty horrible. I'll begin by laying down an outline of where I want the camouflage to run. When we're applying an airbrush camouflage like this, you've got to remember how it was done on the real vehicle. It wasn't done with a great deal of care. It was slapped on with aerosols or large-scale spray guns. And so there will be overspray and scruffy bits here and there, so don't worry too much about the absolute perfection of the finish. This is why the airbrush is so good for replicating this, this effect. You'll notice that the pattern I'm applying is pretty random um, and I'm trying to replicate exactly how they did this in the field. So there was no strict factory patterns, they just put it on according to how they felt. Most modern paint finishes aren't completely flat, they have a slight satin effect. And to replicate this I'm going to use Johnson's Wax Clear, which is actually a floor polish based on an acrylic compound. But it provides a very, very smooth, even and quite hard finish. 
and it's very easy to airbrush. I'm going to pour a fairly small amount of the stuff straight into the airbrush, not forgetting that when we're spraying any kind of model substance, paints or anything like this, we must ventilate the work area. It's very important, even for things that say they're non-toxic, because we don't want them in our lungs. And there we have an overall satin finish that when dry will provide a nice protective film for the extreme weathering effects that we're going to apply. The major parts of the model were sprayed, as you saw, with Tamiya acrylic paints, which are optimised for airbrushing. For the hand painting techniques, however, I'm going to use Vallejo's model colour range, which is absolutely perfect for hand painting, is very controllable and dries quickly. To create the lighter shade we need for the mapping technique, I'm going to start with model colour ivory, just a very small drop, and model colour desert yellow, again, small amount. Mix those two together to get a pale version of the desert yellow. And add it to this some of the model colour slow dry, which slows the drying time down and gives us a little bit more time to work with, with these paints. And finally, some plain tap water to thin the paint slightly and makes it flow nicely and makes it more controllable. We should get a nice creamy consistency and we can swirl this around until we're happy with the material. Taking up a small amount of the pale mix and we're going to work on the top edge of the armour plate here and the key to this is less is more. Very, very small strokes with the paintbrush. Keeping it very fine. Tiny marks we're trying to make here. It's all about subtlety. We do not want to overdo this technique. If it's not enough, we can always come back and do it again. But work in very small brush strokes. And yes, it is a very slow, tedious technique sometimes. The paint is almost translucent. I'm just building it up. With the lighter shade on and in the process of drying, we can prepare the darker shade, which is to simulate steel with a slight rust to it. And for this, I'm going to use German camouflage brown, a little bit of the green, and even a little bit of the previous colour to make a kind of greyish shade, and again a little bit of the retardant and some plain tap water. And the technique here is to follow the pattern of the pale scratches, but slightly back in from it, leaving a very fine lip of pale colour. And again, very, very small brush strokes, tiny movements, little dashes and dots, until the effect gradually builds up. Because you don't want to overdo this one, otherwise it's going to look quite unrealistic. And here you can see the technique gradually building up. It's important to pause and have a look. Plus the fact, because the paint is wet, it just has a slight shine to it, and that will change as it dries. So we need to sometimes stop, let the paint dry, and see how the effect looks. You can make very fine, small scratches around to suggest the crew's movements with their boots. This is an area of the tank that would have been walked over quite a lot, so this particular high point will be quite heavily worn and scraped. But other areas will be less extreme, so bear that in mind when you're doing this effect. The green camouflage colour would of course been applied, as we did, over the sand colour. And when the crew move around over the vehicle, the green will be the first colour to start peeling off and start wearing off. So to simulate that, we're just going to apply a mix of acrylic paints pretty close to the under colour of the vehicle to suggest that the green has worn off. Again, small amounts of paint moving in on a logical area. Try and imagine where the green might peel off and rub off work your way round creating a pattern of scratches and scrapes constantly stopping to check your work the key to this is keeping it random constantly checking what we're doing keeping it realistic using tiny dots 
tiny dashes to simulate little scrapes and scratches on the high points like this rough piece of welding here would have been made up of little tiny peaks of metal and where the boots of the crew have moved over it we need to simulate the fact that that green has worn right off but then in the more protected areas of the paint like in this area next to this device here the green would have remained so we don't want to work the scratches into there because that's where the paint would have been shielded from the wear and tear of the crew's boots. To simulate where the original sand colour has actually worn down to maybe the primer or even the bare metal of the tank, we're going to go back in and apply some dark scratches following the line that we did before, but coming round just to apply some steely coloured paint damage within the sand portion of the camouflage. And this gives some continuity and also a welcome bit of contrast in the whole thing. Putting in some scoring, very fine scratches, scrapes, dents, bruises in the paint to build up an effect that looks quite realistic. For the darker scratches, I'm using model colour German Camouflage Brown, which is a great all-round colour and seems to work on pretty much anything. It's always handy to keep close to hand. As well as combat, tanks are used for all sorts of other duties, such as busting down buildings and driving through undergrowth, and the paint gets scratched and scraped as they pass through. So using a slightly thinner mix of the dark one we used earlier, we're going to apply some horizontal scrapes and scratches to the vehicle. We're doing this very subtly, you may not even see some of these until they dry, but it's an important part to build up the effect that we're trying to suggest that the vehicle has gone through some pretty hard times. Plus, we're going to be putting on some small rust streaks later, and rust doesn't just appear at random, it has to come from somewhere. So we're going to make some little dots, which suggest some actual holes in the paint, and from those holes we'll be streaking rust downwards later on. Thin paint is useful here, because we only want a translucent effect, we want a thin scraping and scratching to appear on the side of the turret and also the sides of the vehicle and the front of the vehicle where it's moved through the environment. And now with most of the scratching in place we can put the final few little dings in ready for the next step. I'm using the German camouflage brown again just to make a few small scores and scratches in areas that would receive the most damage in this case on the fender. And that's that step pretty much done. The next thing to look at on our T55 are some more focused weathering techniques such as oil stains, fuel stains and general darkening around the working areas of the vehicle. For this we're going to use a more concentrated mix of MIG Productions 502 abtiling oil colours which are a very fine grain material and absolutely perfect for this procedure. I'm going to start with wash brown which is a very good all round colour, a little bit of black, just a small amount to help us vary the tone and then some white spirit or mineral spirit. We can then mix these two together and create the wash that we need. Breaking down all the lumps of paint until we have a nice oily liquid. You can see it's quite thin and now that's ready. To help the colour wash move around the model parts I'm going to apply a thin layer of plain white spirit just over the area that I'm going to be working. And this just moistens the area enough to allow the colour to flow nicely. It's important not to put too much of this on, otherwise it will pull and make an unrealistic effect. I'm going to start working on the fuel tanks, the twin external fuel tanks on the side of the vehicle. Back to the colour wash then. Take a fairly good amount on the brush, place it on an area of detail and you can see how immediately the colour flows around the raised areas of detail and the recessed areas as well. We just work our way along, making sure it's nicely distributed, not too heavy, but not so little that it just stops flowing. And this is a more extreme style of wash than we did at first, with a darker tone in the colour to accentuate the fact that these are the oil, or rather fuel drums, where there'll be a lot of seepage and muck building up. If you put too much on, don't worry, it's not a problem. This is a very forgiving material. Simply take a piece of tissue paper, place it on, press gently, mop it off. Taken off the excess, and we can start again. In fact, this often helps in the process because it allows you to see what you've got and see what the staining is building up. 
again it's a case of working with small areas constantly checking how you're doing making sure it looks realistic and that's fundamentally it we let this dry and repeat it if we want to with some different tones of oil paint almost without exception the washes we'll apply to a model armour piece are based on oil paints or spirit based paints enamels etc but just occasionally we'll use an acrylic based wash and these offer certain properties that the oil paints don't possess in other words they'll stay put instead of bleeding into the surrounding paint a particularly good brand is Tensochrome from Life Colour which offers some terrific colours some really nice usable paints to create some oil and fuel stains on the fuel tanks that we've worked on earlier I'm going to use Tensochrome Fuel, Burnt Brown and Smoke and I'm going to mix these slightly with water because they are just a little bit on the thick side for our purposes you only need a small amount and I'll just brush a little bit out onto an old tile cleaning the brush in between small amount of each one and then the smoke which is a tinted black and then we're ready to go now the brush is wet with ordinary tap water we just create a small puddle of this material mix it with a bit of the brown we have a nice grungy fuel coloured pinkish mix we can then apply this mix to the model it can be fairly liberal in the application move it around on the model but you can probably see that it doesn't bleed out into the local paint it stays fairly in one place which is quite handy for creating droplets and streaks and splodges I'm placing the stain around these projections on the end of the fuel tanks because these are the overflows and also the filling points for the fuel tanks it looks slightly milky at this stage but that's just because the liquid is still wet when it dries the true colour will come out and create quite a pleasing oily looking finish again we're working with thinned colours nothing too extreme building up the effect gradually in layers which not only looks better but it gives us a lot more control and if we make a mistake it's much easier to correct if you make a mistake with these colours it's not a problem if you're quick you can wash it off with plain water if it's dried a little bit you can use brush cleaner such as Tamir's X20A thinner or Vallejo's own brush cleaner if worse comes to worse you can overpaint it because don't forget we're doing weathering here quite a creative process and little corrections usually add to the whole texture we've looked at surface damage to the paint and also the application of dust two key factors in AFE modelling but another very important factor is staining this can be caused by rust, fuel, oil and other materials that get spilt on the vehicle's surface and there's no better place to do this than the fuel tank on the T55's fender for the following stage I'm going to use more tense chrome colours this time to smoke again plus rust which also works to tone down the black and give it a nice oily finish again take a blob from each wipe the brush and then they can be blended on the tile until we attain the colour that we're after this time I'm not going to dilute them with water because I want a more concentrated effect and I'm going to apply this again to the overflow and filling caps of the fuel tanks dotting it around but also allowing it to spread slightly as fuel may as you can see this is quite a sticky looking goo which will be created on the real vehicle by the build up of sand and dust around these areas the fuel would then soak into those particles and sit there and darken and become a nice grungy mess that modelers love so much let this flow around these corners try and imagine that it's real oil that you're working with, real fuel and just let it build up gradually and enjoy yourself doing it these are the real fun parts of doing models you can thin this slightly if you want a more spread out effect in fact you can apply quite large areas to the surface of the tank which gives a nice patchworky effect and helps to add a little bit more interest to the structure you can really get the feel that someone's sloshed oil all over this and not wiped it up afterwards it's a case again of using your imagination reference photographs if you can just let it build up until you get an effect that you're happy with and you can see now it's starting to look very stained very oily, really beat up which is far more interesting than the bland tank that we looked at at first
You can vary the colour as you go. I've added a little bit more red now, which hopefully simulates the fuel tone. And really getting that working around all these handles, the nozzles, the stamped pattern in the fuel tank itself. We'll let that dry, see how the effect looks, then we can move on to some further effects on this particular part of the model. Rust obviously comes from the steel of the vehicle, but it has to penetrate the paint somehow, and this usually occurs through pitting. And to simulate this, I'm actually going to use Mission Model's micro chisel with a very fine tip. I'm actually going to create some small scratches and holes and dings along the edge of the fuel tank. Bearing in mind that this item on the real vehicle would be made from pressed steel rather crudely. And so we can quite happily make little nicks and holes. They're not really visible at the moment, but when we put the rust finish on, they'll actually come into their own. I don't want to go too far with this, but you can feel them with the fingertip. And these would be most apparent on the edges. This is basically a needle, a very fine pointed tool. That's the pitting, now we're ready to apply the rust. With the pitting done, we're going to apply some small touches of rust now using MIG Productions Standard Rust, which is a fine rust coloured pigment. And for this, we take a small amount of it out. You only need very tiny amounts of this material. And then, using the wash we made earlier, the black wash, some white spirit on the brush at first, pick up a small amount of our paste, and then just allow that liquid to run into those pits that we made with the tool. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit heavy at the moment because we're going to reduce that in a moment. With that on, we then take another brush and just draw those vertically down. The effect is subtle, but it is in there. And when it dries, that dusty powder will really come into its own and look like fresh rust. Really heavily rusted areas of tanks require more than just pigment. They'll actually need a base coat of brown paint. And a really good area to work on is this guard over the exhaust pipe on our T55. I'm just going to treat it as though we're doing the paint chips, but actually what we're trying to simulate here is where the paint has burnt away, leaving exposed metal. And as I'm sure you know, burnt metal always seems to rust much more rapidly than normal exposed steel. The T55 had a very large, powerful diesel engine and the exhaust pipe became absolutely red hot during operation, which would bake off any paint coat of parts surrounding it. I'm using Vallejo Brown acrylic paint here, just dotting in specks of rust again, like our pitting technique, applying it to the tops of these ribs and just letting that build up gradually until we have a very heavily rusted pitted effect keeping it random, don't work on one area and then work your way around. Dot a little bit in one corner, move to another corner, come back to the same one so that you're working in a very random way. This is supposed to be a natural texture, not a pattern that's been man-made. I'm going to add a little water to this just to get a slightly different effect amongst these pits here. As you can see it's a more faded effect but it all adds to the patination that we're trying to accumulate here. And there we have the base of our rusted exhaust shroud. Now we're going to go back in with some pigments to create the final effect over the top of these acrylic paints. Don't forget to paint the exhaust itself. Obviously this is a large cast steel or cast iron item. Quite tricky to get the paintbrush down the edges here. But just work that brown acrylic paint all over it. Again, the absolute precision of this finish isn't important because this is going to actually be covered with a sooty black finish on the final piece. But we do need an undercoat. Again, you can either build this up in thin layers of watered down paint or you can hit it with a fairly heavy layer of neat paint because we're going to apply 
other effects over the top of it. The structure here is actually the back of the exhaust box where it comes out of the engine bay. And again, this would get very hot, so we want to apply some pitting. I'm going to change brushes to a finer tip one. I'm just going to put some pits here. To keep the effect more interesting, I'm actually going to leave a, quite a good amount of the original camouflage colour in place on this part. Just to contrast with all the heavy rusting going on further down the line. Putting it along. Just think of the way that the rust might burst through a paint finish on an old car and you'll be pretty much there. It's all about observation and it's not just tanks that rust, old iron gates, signposts, old cars, plant equipment. It all takes on the same natural finish so always keep your eye out. I think that will do until we go on to the next stage now. This is where we put the final rust finish onto our exhaust using MIG Pigment Standard Rust, which is a fantastic all-round colour for this kind of effect. Pick up a small amount of the pigment on a brush, which has been dampened with enamel thinner, and we just go back in onto the top of the exhaust box here. First thing to do is lay in a line of this nice bright powdery rust effect. And the first thing to do here is actually stop and dry off this part just to check that we're getting the effect we want. So I'm going to stop that, go to the hairdryer and just see how it goes. If anything, the effect we have here is slightly too bright. So using a clean, fresh brush with no paint or pigment on, I'm just going to go back in and soften the effect. What's actually happening here is that the existing dust that we've applied to the model is blending in with the rust effect and toning it down just takes the edge off, makes it look a little less cartoony. Of course this is an exhaust pipe and there's one crucial thing missing from our model and that is exhaust soot. And we're going to go in with yet another one of these fabulous pigments from MIG Productions which is just a beautiful carbony black. Using it dry and we place it into this exhaust outlet and just roll it around make it look nice and sooty. If you ever get to a tank show, have a close-up look at the T55, there's bound to be one there, and you'll see actually that these are outlets of absolute oily, dripping filth. It's not just nice dry soot. And if you really want to go to town, you can actually put some oil streaks, all sorts of muck, and it even finds its way down onto the road wheels. But for the purposes of this, I'm just going to put this black soot in, which looks fine, I think. You can just draw that out slightly onto the lip of the exhaust pipe. Not too far though, because this will just belch out sideways, and we don't want to obliterate our nice rust finish. But with the addition of soot, that exhaust looks quite convincing, I think. OK, I think our T55 is looking pretty good, but just to emphasise the fact that this is a desert vehicle, and I think the final thing I'm going to do to it is to add some vertical rust streaks, just to emphasise the fact that this is a vehicle that would have been based in the desert, and rust really does appear on desert vehicles because they get very hot in the day, cold at night, and the condensation causes a build-up of moisture. Using a nearly dry brush, I'm going to use some MIG Productions oil paint here. I'm going to apply some very small dots of this rust-coloured paint to the pits that we made at the start. And I'm very carefully making sure that I apply the rust at the bottom edge of each of these scrapes because that is where the rusty water from the rain would run out. I've even made a few little holes here with the pitting tool. And it doesn't look like much at the minute, but what we're going to do now is dampen a flat brush slightly enamel thinners and draw those streaks straight down, hoping that our oil paint will follow the direction of the brush and create a streaked effect. This is a subtle technique like all of our techniques, but you can repeat it as much as you like. Go back in with some dots of oil around these fittings particularly, because where they're welded on, you will get rust running down. Draw them straight down. Apply some oil paint to these hooks. Keep it as vertical as you can. And just work that downwards until you have the effect you want. And when that is dry, hair dryer again, 
You'll see a really very appealing, quite nicely faded rust effect. This vehicle in particular lends itself to this technique and it's probably the, one of the most extreme cases where you'd apply it. On other vehicles that maybe were maintained better or didn't see such harsh conditions you'll have to keep the effect much more subtle. But one of the beauties of doing modern tanks like this T55 is you can really go to town on the weathering which is what I really enjoy. And there we have some very simple, quick to apply but very convincing looking vertical rust streaks made by rain. Real tanks are made from steel, but models tend to be made from plastic or resin, so we need to find some techniques that can simulate a realistic metallic finish. The first technique we're going to look at is the creation of a burnished steel finish, as you may find on a breech block of a gun or on towing cables. On this Marder 3M, which has an exposed interior, we can see the breech block and slide, which are all polished steel, and for this we've used a graphite pencil, which is a very, very handy material. On this T-34 the towing cables are very prominent and the ends have gathered at the front of the vehicle. They display a very brightly burnished steel finish and again I've used the graphite pencil to simulate this. To illustrate a burnished steel effect we're going to turn back to our T-55 and work on the towing eyes on the cables which are fitted to the fenders of the model. I'm using the graphite pencil again I'm just going to apply some scrapes and dots and scratches to areas of the towing eyes that would receive most abuse. You can leave it at this if you want because the effect is quite satisfying but I'm going to add another little touch to it that will make it just that bit special. Graphite is a very smudgy material and it can be moved around very easily once it's in place. I'm just continuing to apply a few more chips and dents with this graphite pencil and then I'm going to use a small motor tool with a nylon brush fitted to bring up a nice sheen. That only needs a few light touches. I think you'll agree that the effect is quite realistic. The graphite pencil can also be used in other areas of the model that aren't as extremely chipped as that, such as back to our fender. We use it on its edge just to get the high points of these ribs blended in with the fingertip. On the headlight cage, which the crew would probably stand on, so the whole top surface of this will be worn right back to the metal. It's quite a thick component on the real tank and will easily support the weight of a crew member. So you can really go to town on this. <sighs> Always blow away the excess graphite which is quite crumbly and fall down onto the model surface and looks slightly unrealistic. <sighs> so just blow it away. Another excellent use for a nice pointed tip piece of graphite like this is for creating a metallic finish in the end of a gun barrel. Just press the tip of the pencil into the barrel and rotate it a few times and then draw straight across the end of the muzzle. It doesn't have to be particularly neat. It is a pencil so you're kind of drawing with it until that's all filled in. And then again we use the motor tool. To create a nice steely looking finish. We're going to move on to the finishing stages of detail painting an AFE model. In this case, to me is 148 scale Tiger 1. We're going to have a look at painting the on-vehicle tools which I've fixed to the model in preparation for their painting process. To give a little bit of a clearer access to the tools, I'm just going to remove the turret and place it to one side for safety. The tools on AFEs are sometimes left in their natural wooden state and other times they end up being painted the same colour as the vehicle itself. In the case of our Tiger 1, I'm going to paint a natural wood finish mixing colours from these Vallejo acrylic paints. You'll notice I'm using a fairly wide variety of shades starting with this sandy brown, a darker brown to adjust the tone, similar sandy brown but in the model air range which is thinner and help the paint flow and finally this colour which is actually a flesh colour from Andrea but is also very useful to simulate wood tones. I'm going to take some of this sandy yellow at first and I think some of this flesh colour which will make a good base for our tools. Mix it round, although actually because we're trying to simulate wood you don't need to mix these paints that thoroughly. If you get a slightly streaky finish it will add to the overall effect. I'm going to work on this track hammer first using very small strokes just to apply the colour 
taking care to leave the brackets in the shade of the vehicle because this is the reason we paint the tools in place on the model is so that they look part of the vehicle and not just something that's been stuck on at the end it may seem an awkward way to do it but actually the model makes a rather good base for the tools to sit on and you only need to paint the parts you can see because the rest will be hidden hold the brush right down on the ferrule so you have maximum control and then you can actually even rest a finger on the model so you're not shaking around and then just gently draw the paint around the tool and any areas you miss will actually be in shadow you can see now we've established a fairly even but rather flat looking sand colour to the wooden handle of this tool we could leave it there it looks quite neat but I always feel that it's nice to blend that tool in slightly using a little bit of brown oil paint and apply a tiny line of brown right up against the edge of the clamps doesn't matter at this stage that that's a rather clumsy looking application of paint because we're going to blend that in a moment and just at the base of the head of the tool it looks a little bit stripy we just work a little paint in there we're using the same very fine quality 4-0 brush we're going to moisten it just slightly in enamel thinners then come back to the model and just work that oil paint in just to soften that edge fading it up against the edges where it sits. The idea here is to not have a hard demarcation line at all, just to suggest that there's a little bit of shadow onto the wood and draw it up and down. It's a subtle effect but it does help to make the tool look a bit more three-dimensional. As before we could stop now because it looks quite convincing but if you really want to go to town on the tool you can add a little bit of wood grain effect. We go back in with the acrylics and I'm using the flesh tone here which is slightly darker than the mix we made. I'm going to come back in and just do very faint diagonal stripes across the piece. I don't want to make it look actually stripy, just trying to simulate wood grain here, which is obviously a natural material and uneven. just want to break up the effect. A little bit of the darker colour, a little bit too dark if anything. Come back in, just the occasional streak across the handle to actually suggest that this has got a grain texture. Now obviously we haven't got any paint on the underside of the tool, but that doesn't matter because it's glued to the vehicle and we're not going to see it. But as it is, that looks quite acceptable. The final stage of finishing our on-vehicle tools is to apply a metallic finish to the steel areas of the tools. And for this our friend the graphite pencil is absolutely perfect. Around the edges we're just going to touch in a small number of scrapes and dings and scruffs just to suggest that this tool has been used but perhaps has sat on the vehicle for a little while and collected a layer of dust. As I said, you don't need to cover the whole part in this. In fact, it's better if you don't, because it'll look too bright and shiny. Don't forget that it's a shovel, so we want to draw some of these scratches up the length of it. And once again, the graphite pencil has come into its own. Absolutely superb for this kind of effect. And here we have our Tiger One with its tools painted. All of these tools have been painted in situ on the vehicle, which some modellers question the validity of, but I actually think it's a lot easier. Firstly, they're glued in place and they're not moving around. Secondly, you only have to paint half the tool, which saves time. One of the more challenging finishes to replicate on a model is German Panzer Grey, which in reality is a rather dull, monotonous colour. So on a model we need to come up with some techniques that make it look a lot more interesting to the viewer. I'm going to show you two ways of recreating an interesting finish with Panzer Grey. Both quite different, but both equally valid. Let's start with a more traditional shaded, dry brushed and lightly washed finish, which requires a solid base coat of Tamiya German Grey XF63. And there's our starting point, a nice even flat coat of German Panzer Grey. Now we're going to apply a little bit of shading which requires a lighter shade of grey and we start with the same German XF63 grey, add just a spot of Tamiya XF15 flat flesh which I find is a great colour for lightening other shades. Mix that round 
always check what we've got before we apply it to the model and then to prepare it for spraying add a bit of acrylic thinners and what we're going to try and do is apply this lighter colour to the centre of these panels just to break up the monotony of that flat sheet of steel it's important to keep this very very subtle otherwise it'll end up looking a bit like a patchwork quilt let the paint dry between applications let the effect develop it's a subtle effect but it breaks up the monotony of that grey hopefully you can see that now we're going to make a slightly darker mix of our Panzer Grey using some Tamiya flat black to apply a bit of post shading as it's sometimes known swirl that around a bit get those two colours working together and again re-thin that slightly because the addition of the black will increase the viscosity and it won't spray as nicely a little bit more because we're actually making a thin almost a wash that's going to go on with the airbrush load it up and we can begin applying some very thin strokes into the recessed areas of the model Spraying the black down these weld seams and over these rivets and you can even draw a little bit of the black downwards to help with the rain marks which we're going to apply later and using the airbrush on moderate air pressure with a heavily thin paint which gives us a lovely smooth grain free finish There we have a fairly subtle but quite nice shaded starting point for our traditional Panzer Grey finish. And all that's left now is a little bit of dry brushing, which we'll take a look at. Dry brushing is a modelling technique that's been around for many, many years and has helped a lot of modellers obtain a very attractive finish to their work. It's slightly fallen out of fashion lately, but never write off any technique because they do have their uses. And in this case, it helps to highlight the raised detail on the model part. I'm using MIG's 502 Abtile and Modelling Colours again, and in this case, Faded Grey. I've squirted some out onto a piece of coarse cardboard, which will help draw the oil out of the paint and make the correct consistency that we need. Our oil paint sat on this piece of cardboard now for a few moments, and the linseed oil within the oil paint has started to leach into the card, leaving behind just the pigment, which is precisely what we want. Any moisture in the brush in the form of model thinners will cause streaking on the model part which will look awful so make sure it really is soft and new and dry we're going to collect just the smallest smallest amount of paint onto our brush from the driest area of the oil paint roll the brush around just to distribute that nicely make sure that it's even on the tips of your brush and then we can begin working on the model this is all about subtlety so build it up very slowly dragging your nearly bone dry brush across the raised points of detail on the model. It's essential to stop and check your work regularly, as I've always said, otherwise this technique can get out of hand. It's a hard one to correct if it goes too far, because it really means you have to wash off all your dry brushing and start again. You may just be able to see this weld seam has started to be highlighted out of the background colour. If you thought dry brushing was a subtle technique, adding a spot of rust to the surface needs to be even more subtle, and that's what we're going to do now. Once again we're using MIG Pigments rust colours, in this case standard rust, PO25. We are going to add the tiniest, tiniest spot of rust to the bottom edge of each of these little rivets here. It needs to be absolutely weeny, weeny little dot otherwise the model's going to take on a cartoon-like appearance. You can also add a spot to this weld seam and then very gently draw that rust stain downwards in the direction that the water would naturally run down the side of the model or the vehicle. Subtlety is absolutely key here. If you overdo it though, don't worry. Just get some plain water and wash it off with a fresh paintbrush. <laughs> 
you won't get rid of all the stain but it will reduce the effect I think there you can probably just about see some nice vertical streaks of rust appearing which gives a spot of colour to this boring old grey surface and adds a bit of realism too from this more traditional Verlinden-esque style, we're going to turn to the other side of the model part now and apply a finish that might be called extreme weathering. It's certainly in fashion at this current time. As with the other style, we're going to begin with a base of XF63 German Grey from Tamir. We just need to let this dry and then we're going to begin with the weathering effects. With our layer of German Panzer Grey now dry, we're going to create a fairly pale dust mix using Tamiya Flat Earth XF52. I'm actually going to apply what we might call reverse shading. Assuming this was actually the side of a vehicle, dust would spray up the side of it. So what we're going to try and imagine is that dust has caught along the edge of here and run up in these seams. As you can see it's quite the opposite of what we did with the shading technique where the paler colour is in the recesses and around these raised pieces of detail to create the effect that the dust has collected in those recesses. There we have an initial layer of dust. We're going to put a few more effects onto this, but that's most of the job done. The second layer of dust now goes on, and it's Europe Dust again from MIG Productions. Using it dry this time, and a small quantity on a wide brush, and we're going to work this into these gaps, into these recesses, to create a streaky, rain-soaked effect. Use a fingertip here as well, just to rub that in. Draw it down vertically, a little bit too heavy there, so the finger comes in again, just to remove that back a bit. And in fact the slight oiliness of our fingertips helps in this process, because we want to add a considerable degree of burnishing to the dark grey, which is actually what would have happened on the real vehicle, where the crew move in and out and across the surface. You might be able to see the top edge of this piece of model is actually starting to darken, which is just the effect we want because this is where the crew might have leaned over the edge, climbed over it, and causing that paint to actually burnish up with their boots and their uniforms. You can see we've got a nice uneven streaky finish going on here, which can be built up over a series of layers until we're happy with the effect. That's more or less it. In the final stage, we're going to take the trusty graphite pencil again and we're just going to make a quick pass along the very top edge of there to suggest that the paint's actually gone right back through to the steel and it just adds a suggestion that this is all steel and not actually a lump of polystyrene. We're just going to catch the tops of those rivets as well. You can even add a few little nicks and dashes and touches just to suggest that this vehicle's seen a bit of a hard life. And that is what could be called an extreme weathering technique, although it's actually quite subtle. But I think you'll agree, it's rather different to the traditional shaded, dry brushed, the Linden style. But both equally valid, both attractive, and they can indeed be blended to create new techniques. We've looked at two quite contrasting techniques to create a nice finish with German Panzer Grey. And on this 135th scale FAMO by Tamir, I've actually combined the two techniques in various areas to create new patinas and textures where appropriate in different parts of the model. Along the edge of the fender here we can see some paint chipping, some shading merging into dust, we can see some application of graphite on this curved edge where the troops would have marched up these steps, some quite worn metallic areas on this grip plate here, and also some shading, some application of dust, 
further chips, streaks, washes and staining to create a nice busy looking texture on what would otherwise be a really rather bland finish. Around the back of the vehicle where the dust would have been kicked up by the tracks we can see a thin film of dust up the rear fenders which partially obscure the number plate and other vehicle markings and all add to a realistic overall finish. 